Today we are talking about Hindu dvesha, what actually we know Hindu phobia. Hindu phobia बढ़ता चला जा रहा है और उसके बारे में कोई कंसर्न भी मेन स्ट्रीम सोसाइटीज में नहीं है उसका कारण यह है कि हमारे अपने हिंदू बहन भाई इस सिलसिला में खुल के आवाज नहीं उठाते खुल के अपना नैरेटिव पेश नहीं करते हम दूसरी तरफ देखते हैं एक लंबी हिस्ट्री है एंटीसेमिटिज्म की हमारे जूस ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर्स ने अपनी स्पेस क्लेम की और उनको दुनिया भर में अपनी स्पेस मिली तमाम तर दिक्कतों के बावजूद हम मुस्लिम बरदरी में देखते हैं उनको महसूस हुआ कि हमारे खिलाफ बात होती है खास तौर पर नाइन अलेवन के बाद इस्लामोफोबिया की टर्मिनोलॉजी क्वाइन हुई और उनके ख्याल में ये उनका प्रॉब्लम था और उन्होंने इसको पोलिटिकली इतना आगे बढ़ाया कि अब किसी भी वेस्टर्न कंट्री में ज़रा सी बात को भी इस्लामोफोबिया के नाम से देखा और समझा जाता है इसी तरह हम सिख बहन भाइयों को देखते हैं वो भी अपनी आइडेंटिटी अपनी इंटेग्रिटी के लिए भरपूर तरीके से आवाज़ उठाते हैं ज़रा सी कहीं पर उन्हें महसूस हो कि आवाज़ उठती है तो वो कोई कसर उठा नहीं रखते पॉलिटिकल ईवानों को हिला देने के लिए ऑन द अदर हैंड हमारे जो हिंदू बहन भाई हैं वो बहुत ही ज़्यादा हम्बल्ड हैं उन पर इतने अटैक्स होते हैं कि ये कोई आज कल की बात नहीं सदियों से ऐसा होता चला आ रहा है शायद सदियों की ही वो साइकोलॉजी बनी हुई है कि अपने ऊपर जुल्म को वो बर्दाश्त करते रहते हैं और उस पर आवाज़ भी नहीं उठाते मैं ख़ुद को बार बार कहता हूँ कि आई एम हिंदू बॉर्न एंड मुस्लिम फेथ हमारे यहाँ मुस्लिम उम्मा का एक वर्ड है मेरे लिए जो उम्मा मेरी है वो हिंदू बरदरी है बिकॉज उम्मा क्या होती है वो सिविलाइजेशन वो नेशन वो कौम जिसके साथ आप महसूस करें कि आप घंटों बात कर सकते हैं सालों जी सकते हैं मिल के ये है मेरी उम्मा जो हिंदू सिविलाइजेशन के साथ जुड़ी हुई है जब मैं अपनी हिंदू सिविलाइजेशन के बहन भाइयों को देखता हूँ तो वो इस सिलसिला में सबसे कम आवाज़ उठाते हैं नरेटिव भी नहीं है कोई भी ऐसी बात नहीं हो रही लेकिन एक थोड़ा सा रिलीफ मुझे कुछ सालों से देखने सुनने और मुशाह करने की हद तक मिल रहा है कि ख़ास तौर पर अमेरिका में वी वाले या अमेरिकन जो यूनिवर्सिटी हिंदू यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ अमेरिका है वर्ल्ड हिंदू काउंसिल ऑफ अमेरिका है हिंदू अमेरिकन फाउंडेशन है इस तरह के जो इदारे हैं वो अब इस बात को उठा रहे हैं जो सिस्टेमिक हिंदू फोबिया हिंदू द्वेशा यानी जो उसका एग्जैक्ट है वो उस पर आवाज़ उठा रहे हैं लेकिन अभी ये आवाज़ बहुत धीमी है उस तरह की नहीं है जिस तरह दूसरी बरदरियाँ अपने हकूक के लिए अपनी आवाज़ उठाते हैं और अपनी स्पेस को क्लेम करते हैं या रीक्लेम करते हैं इसी अमल को आगे बढ़ाना ज़रूरी होगा इसी पर बातचीत के लिए आज मैं जुड़ा हुआ हूँ कल्याण विश्वनाथ जी के साथ जो हिंदू यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ अमेरिका के बहुत ही इम्पॉर्टेंट फिगर हैं और उनके साथ साथ जाहब अंसाल जी जो वर्ल्ड हिंदू काउंसिल ऑफ अमेरिका के साथ जुड़े होने के नाते हिंदू बरदरी के लिए बहुत काम कर रहे हैं मैं इन दोनों दोस्तों को वेलकम करता हूं आज अपने शो में आई एम जॉइन विद जेब अंसाल जी एज वेल एज कल्याण विश्वनाथ जी माई फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन टू कल्याण विश्वनाथ What is the difference between Hindu phobia and Hindu devotion? That's a great question. Uh, you know, we have debated extensively on this, uh, the, this uh, difference in the definition of these two terms. Uh, phobia is actually a Greek word. You know, it comes from Greece. Uh, devotion is a Sanskrit word. It comes from India. And the difference is, phobia is centered around fear. Uh, for example, you know, you, 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 uh, claustrophobia is the fear of enclosed spaces. You know, <coughs> arachnophobia is the fear of spiders, and so on. Now, Hindu phobia, <laughs> in that logic, would would imply fear of the Hindus, but in reality, no, nobody is afraid of the Hindus. You know, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know distaste 
dislike for Hinduism and Hindus and so on, there is no fear really. Dvesha, on the other hand, is more directly uh, representing hatred or uh, uh, some, some sort of uh, intense disdain or dislike for Hindus and Hinduism. So we thought we will work with the term Hindu Dvesha, but we're going to use it uh, in conjunction with uh, Hindu phobia, systemic Hindu phobia. So I hope that clarifies. No, thank you. Thank you for this uh, uh, clarification. It really helps. Uh, Mr. Jay Bansal, how do American Hindus experience Hindu Dvesha today? Yeah, so, uh, good question. Uh, we are seeing Hindu Dvesha being expressed in many different ways. Uh, so, for easy description, uh, we'll try to put them in five broad categories. The first category is the academia. You see, uh, Hindu Dvesha as a phenomenon has a long history uh, going back, way back into India's colonial period. In late 1700s and early 1800s, uh, British colonizers were slowly gaining ground in India and they were subjugating more and more uh, part of the uh, Hindu population. They realized that they didn't really know much about uh, uh, these people. They didn't know about their religion, about their social customs, about their cultural practices, and so on and so forth. So this gave rise to the creation of a new area of study uh, called Oriental Studies, which eventually became uh, what, what is now called Western Indology. Over time, uh, many academics, including some well-known names, uh, like James Mill and uh, Max Miller, a lot of people are familiar with, became part of this effort. They started interpreting Hindu ideas, Hindu scriptures, Hindu practices through the only lens that they knew, which was, of course, the Christian lens. So anything that did not fit that framework, they started calling it crude, they started calling it superstitious, ungodly, stupid, and many other names that I don't want to repeat here. Uh, it's clear from their, their writings that majority of them were deeply bigoted and the only mission they had was to destroy the Hindu community uh, and convert everyone to Christianity. So that is this sort of genesis of uh, Hindu Dvesha in academia. Now, unfortunately, uh, this kind of academic prostitution continues to this day. You know, there are many professors of social sciences uh, in highly prestigious universities who continue to follow in the footsteps of their uh, bigoted academic ancestors and continue to further their racist agenda by producing highly critical, insulting and derisive books and articles about Hindu scriptures, our culture and social practices. Unfortunately, uh, their drivel continues to show up in school textbooks, online media uh, like Wikipedia, and generally shapes the uh, perception of the Western society about Hindus. So that's about academia. Uh, the second uh, category is the entertainment industry. Uh, for a long time, the movies, uh, both from uh, Hollywood as well as Bollywood, have been showing Hindu characters in bad light. Uh, they show them as either clownish or moronic or hypocritical or cruel criminals. Uh, this is now spreading to various streaming services and becoming even more apparent. Uh, the third category is, uh, is the news media. Now, I have to say that traditionally uh, news media in the West has been more or less neutral on Hindu issues. However, in the last few years, it's turned decidedly biased against Hindus. Uh, for instance, you will hardly find an article in the uh, New York Times or Washington Post in the last five, six years that can be considered remotely balanced from Hindu point of view. Uh, the next category is the social media. Well, <laughs> less said about social media, the better. Uh, you know, it's become a place where everyone feels 
empowered to say anything on any subject, you know, whether they know anything about it or not. Unfortunately, we cannot ignore it because it informs people's perceptions about, about Hindus. And unfortunately for Hindus, there are certain very well organized and media savvy organizations which are flooding this communication channel with uh, hateful messages about us. The final uh, group that I want to talk about is uh, the organized syndicates. I alluded to uh, it, you know, these groups a little bit in, uh, in my uh, comments about the social media, but social media is not all they're doing. They're actually also publishing so-called research reports of you know, highly questionable pedigree, and they try to show Hindus as hierarchical and socially oppressive society. Uh, they are typically sponsored by big money, which makes it easy for them to garner a lot of influence in political circles. So Kalyanji, here question arises, is this Hindu dvesha systemic or instigated by some particular anti-Hindu groups or both? Yeah, so I think it is both actually. You know, my feeling is that uh, uh, I would say there are two kinds of Hindu dvesha. Uh, I would call it uh, blatant Hindu dvesha and uh, blind Hindu dvesha. You know? So blatant Hindu dvesha, which is explicit and overt, doesn't even try to hide its discourse as some kind of uh, neutral commentary on the Hindus, is driven by uh, organizations that are motivated and uh, you know we, who, who have uh, who are running a campaign of uh, uh, some kind, uh, you know, they sign petitions, they, they're very active uh, in terms of, uh, you know, demonizing the Hindu community, uh, delegitimizing the Hindu community, and so on. Blind Hindu Dvesha is more systemic. It doesn't occur for people uh, that they are being Hindu Dvesha. It's just that it's become normal, you know, just uh, uh, the great example is this. Uh, uh, this Charlie Hebdo cartoon that just came up. Uh, I don't know if you can put up that cartoon, but you know they they right in the middle of this uh, extraordinary uh, pandemic, the second wave of the pandemic in India. Uh, Charlie Hebdo published a cartoon in which they showed all these people lying on the ground dying in India, and uh, the caption was, uh, you know, 33 million gods. And not want to give them oxygen, some such thing, you know. And this is very, very insensitive, and uh, uh, it's almost like a kind of a blind Hindu, Hindu dvesha, you know. It's uh, uh, it's so baked into the system that it becomes very normal. And unfortunately, Hindus will not react to it at all. They won't do anything. Uh, there is no such thing as a, a response to this. So, uh, so it goes on and on. There's no there's no fear of consequence. So therefore, anybody can say anything to get get away with it. With them. That's the problem. That's systemic. So it's both actually. So Jay Bansalji, is Hindu dvesha increasing, and if so, why? Yeah. So unfortunately, Hindu dvesha is uh, on the upswing in pitch as well as in volume. In fact, hardly any day goes by when you do not see something negative about Hindus in news media, social media, or academia. What is interesting is that the same news piece keeps bouncing around in various media channels, usually with little or no change, as it goes around from one media type to another. You know, it often feels like uh, they're all working in tandem in an echo chamber, we're just ricocheting each other's news pieces. You know, sadly, this gang does not miss any opportunity, no matter how gruesome or how tragic, uh, to find something bad to say about Hindus. My colleague Kalyanji just talked about this Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoon, uh, which, you know, in very unfortunate circumstances for India right now, uh, they find something nasty to say about the situation. 
So, uh, to second part of your question, why is uh, Hindu Dvesha on the rise today? I think there are many reasons for it, uh, uh, Tahirji. <clears throat> Certainly, the advent of uh, the social media is uh, one reason. See, it's so easy to use, doesn't require any particular skills or qualifications or any knowledge of the particular issue that you're commenting on. In fact, you can make something up on the spot and pass it on as real. The beauty is that there are plenty of people around the globe who are happy to take your message and without an iota of thought, lob it over the fence to others. And uh, the end result is that it starts going around the globe in a matter of seconds. The second reason has to do uh, with Hindu community uh, becoming more aware of this phenomenon. And they're beginning to speak out. You see, uh, during the colonial period, the Western world developed some really bad social habits. They got into the habit of pontificating about any and all matters pertaining to Hindus. Hindu society, of course, had no choice but to put up with their nonsense. Even when the colonial period ended, the colonial, colonial mindset did not go away on either side. Now, as Hindus started becoming more and more aware of what has been done to them over the centuries, and uh, that, you know, they have been fed total BS about their history and their heritage, they became more assertive and began to speak out against it. This obviously does not sit well with the Western world, which had gotten used to Hindus being totally docile on the world stage. Um, finally, there is a blowback uh, effect on the political events that take place in India. As the current political system in India has tried to undo some of the gross historical injustices uh, committed against Hindus uh, over the centuries, the Western world, which has always believed somehow that they know how to run the Indian society better than the Indians themselves, began to hyperventilate. Uh, naturally, anything they did not like, they called it oppressive, backward, Hindutva, and other epitaphs that would show us in bad light. So, yeah, there are many, many, many reasons why Hindu Dvesha is on the rise. So, Jay Bansalji, what is the impact of rising Hindu Dvesha on the Hindus? Yeah, sadly, uh, the impact is not good. It's, in fact, it's pretty bad. Firstly, it confuses Hindus as to who they are what their real history is, what their historical contribution to the world is. It creates a deep-seated inferiority complex in them about their culture and their social values. It leads to an inherent aversion of their social and cultural practices and a desire to adopt cultural values and habits of their former colonists. Um, the Hindu diaspora in the West is actually starting to feel a bit threatened and is wondering about its place in the society going forward. They wonder if uh, they will continue to enjoy the economic success that they have worked so hard to build over the last half century or so in America. And in the extreme case, they have to worry about their, uh, their physical safety as well. However, that's not the most insidious consequence of Hindu Dvesha. Uh, the most serious consequences are the next generation. They're obviously consuming this false narrative about their heritage through the school system. They feel defensive and they feel alienated from their cultural heritage. And that is not even the worst of it. They're also experiencing uh, cultural-based bullying in schools and colleges. If this continues, it's not difficult to imagine a day when many of them would feel that holding on to their Hindu identity is just too costly, is too difficult and not worth it, and simply move away from it. 
So, Kalyan ji, uh, if this Hindu Dvesha is systemic, what are the remedies? How do you tackle the anti-Hindu <coughs> groups? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, the first uh, remedy is that uh, Hindus must become aware of what is going on. You know, a, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, uh, they don't uh, recognize it uh, until it happens to them personally. If uh, somebody, if my neighbor is in trouble or somebody else is being victimized, uh, as long as I am fine, my personal life is going reasonably well, I don't really care what happened to my fellow Hindus, etc. Right? So this, this particular kind of attitude, uh, as you could say, is a, maybe a survival mechanism, you know, uh, for the Hindu community right through the colonial era and so on. They they are not particularly aware of how how uh, uh, devious it is. So so the first thing is awareness. You know so uh, what we are doing is trying to raise awareness uh, more than anything else. The second is the ability to respond in real time. You know, uh, and it's hard because uh, something is happening every day. Uh, going back to my example of the Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoon, uh, somebody posted a response. You know, uh, I had to say, God bless her for posting a response. Uh, the response said, uh, you know, one billion Hindus, but nobody's trying to uh, behead you or something like that, you know, which is, um, and Charlie Hebdo will, will get away with saying whatever they want to say about the Hindus because. I mean, the Hindus will just shrug their shoulders and say, okay, fine, you know, say whatever you want and go about their lives. So, uh, this is uh, increasingly a, an opportunity for the Hindu community, which is to respond. So, uh, I'll give you another example. Recently, the Hindu American Foundation uh, has sued a few people, you know, Audrey Treshke, a professor at uh, Rutgers University, uh, as well as uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, for uh, and a few other entities for making some outlandish claims about Hindu American Foundation. So specifically, the claim they made was that uh, uh, something to do with the misuse of uh, uh, funds received from COVID-19 uh, related, uh, uh, you know, funds available from the government of the United States. Uh, they were baseless charges, absolutely false, but they kept on repeating it and repeating it and repeating it until the foundation decided, you know, enough <clears throat> is enough, we're going to have to take some action and they have brought a lawsuit. They, they first sent a cease and desist letter and then they filed a lawsuit. So this legal uh, action is, a, is an important uh, uh, element of the response, you know, how to respond to uh, all organizations and uh, uh, other uh, individuals engaging in Hindu Dvesha. Uh, you know, today there is a very settled and committed response when somebody engages in uh, what you might call Islamophobia or uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, but Hindu Dvesha, Hindu phobia, etc. are not really even recognized as phenomena that even exist and therefore uh, the ability to articulate it, recognize it, and respond to it is a capability that the Hindu community has to develop uh, fairly quickly. So, Jay Bansalji, how do American political parties view and treat Hindus in the United States? Uh, Tahir Bhai, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we are actually in a very interesting paradigm uh, uh, on, that, on that particular point. As you know, there are uh, two political parties in America. They are usually poles apart on all sorts of policy matters. But they have one thing in common. They both like to get elected. Now, Hindu Americans are a pretty sizable community. Uh, according to some figures, there are about 4 million Hindus in America today. Now, if you include other dharmic communities and those who practice certain aspects of Hinduism, the number can be as high as 20 or 30 million people. 
naturally no political party can afford to ignore such a large constituency now if you look at the bigger picture there are over 1 billion hindus in the world that's a huge market by any measure in addition there are many geopolitical circumstances that give india and hindus a strong position for any social bargain the problem is that hindus haven't yet learned how to use their political muscle they organize fundraisers for politicians but then they don't know how to articulate what they need from them uh they are more interested in taking pictures with these politicians so that they can impress their friends with their political clout however i believe that it's only a matter of time that this will change because i believe adversity makes people smart i think hindus will learn how to use their political power to get better bargain in the society than they're getting today uh, i hope it happens sooner than later but i feel it's in- inevitable uh because the alternative is too painful to contemplate uh kalyan ji uh, based on our discussion so far do american hindus have a clear narrative if not then why not mm. yeah so you know uh, most american hindus uh, uh you know have become uh, engineers doctors uh, business people you know they are uh, very successful in uh, technical domains uh, in finance for example on wall street uh, and so on but uh, they they are not particularly grounded uh, and knowledgeable in the humanities the social sciences and the liberal arts and so on uh, what that does is Uh, our knowledge and understanding of uh, narratives uh, themselves how they get constructed how they have been constructed uh, and how they continue to be constructed is pretty cursory pretty weak so uh, often what happens is uh, uh, you know we don't even recognize that what we are hearing today as an isolated incident Uh, in the new york times or in the on the bbc or in the times of india uh is just the latest uh, episode in a grand narrative about the hindus that's been constructed over a 200 year period <clears throat> we don't understand it we just experience it as one isolated incident <laughs> so uh not only hindus are not terribly uh, uh, educated on uh, the dimension of narratives narrative building and the existing narratives in which they exist they they are not actively engaged in creating narratives either because they don't participate in these domains for example it's very rare you know that cnn or the msnbc or fox news or any one of these channels invites a person uh, as a hindu to speak about a particular topic you know people may show up as physicians you know as successful silicon valley entrepreneurs uh, you know as chief executives of big corporations um uh, and so on you know as even as professors of uh, various technical disciplines uh, a neurosurgeon or a uh, you know a professor of computer science or artificial intelligence and so on so there is a lot of uh hindu presence in uh, deeply technical domains but you pick up a topic like uh, human rights or uh, uh, you know the uh, threat threats to democracy or any one of these social causes and issues and so on <clears throat> nobody ever asks somebody to come and uh, talk about them from a hindu perspective because uh you know in the mainstream uh, narrative uh, structure uh hindu presence or hindu narrative has been uh, marginalized into becoming as a footnote you know meaning that yeah there are also hindus but 
uh, nobody looks for any, any particularly uh, significant view from the Hindus. So, as a result, uh, the activity of narrative creation is barely beginning right now, barely underway. So, this is the issue that I see with the Hindu community. Also, our viewers uh, like to know, how do you intend to create a clear and effective Hindu narrative? Mm. Yeah, you know, it's a very important question. And, you know, uh, see, the creation of a narrative is not one person's job. You know, uh, particularly with a community that is as large as the Hindu community. Uh, there have to be many, many, many voices speaking. Uh, it's not a one-man performance, you know. <laughs> One person cannot create a Hindu narrative. You can create a personal <coughs> narrative. I can tell my story, but that is not the Hindu narrative, you see. So, uh, I think what is required is um, um, some kind of capacity building, uh, so, some kind of awareness and recognition. And that's why uh, one of the things that I feel uh, that's very important is for Hindus to get educated first. Uh, but in the humanities, uh, you know, global humanities, in the liberal arts and social sciences, uh, you know, they should understand how these narratives have been constructed, uh, what is the history of these narratives, who started it, who are the major players, how did it get built up and expanded upon generation after generation for so many years centuries now. Uh, and to do that, education is the only uh, remedy. You know, and as Hindus get educated, uh, in fact, that's one of the things that I'm working on is to make this Hindu University of America a mainstream institution, which is accessible to uh, not only Hindus, everybody, because, uh, you know, they, to learn about uh, Hindus from a Hindu perspective, uh, you know, what we need is uh, systematic and sustained education. Uh, and once people are educated and they feel like they can speak up and speak up responsibly, uh, speak up uh, uh, confidently, then as more and more voices begin to emerge, uh, I feel that a Hindu narrative will, will emerge, you know, and that narrative has to speak from many different voices. It has to speak in the media, it has to speak in the movies, it has to speak in the television programs, in, uh, in uh, social media voices, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, in cartoons. I mean, you think about it today, it's the range of possibilities for expressing something so wide and varied, uh, you know. Uh, so slowly, I, I hope that uh, there'll be a increased, an increasing presence of Hindu voices in the public square where narratives are created and, and built over time. So in the end, Javan Salji, uh, would you like to add uh, something in our discussion today? Uh, you precisely think we are missing so far? I think we covered a lot of uh, a lot of topics. Uh, uh, we uh, clearly we know that Hindu dvesha is something that we need to tackle. And as Kalyanji said, in order to tackle, we have to create a counter narrative. And counter narrative can only be created uh, by knowing what the facts are. Uh, you know, you cannot you cannot just. Uh, uh, have some idea in your head and start playing it out in the public square without actually having some facts behind it. So uh, I think educating ourselves is is the key. Uh, and uh, I look forward to a day day when we have enough foot soldiers in this you know in this in this uh, uh, battle for reclaiming our uh, our heritage and and uh, you know reestablishing the truth world. Uh, about our heritage. Um, I think we will explore uh, different aspects of uh, this issue perhaps in uh, future uh, in future conversation of this type by by. But I think for now, maybe we can park it here. Thank you very much, friends. I really appreciate for your time. This is a very, very important issue, and we all need to focus on it, and we all need to curb Hindu Dvesha 
are what we call Hindu phobia as well uh, from our societies. Absolutely, it is uh, it is required. Thank you very much once again uh, you. for your participation for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You are watching Candid Talk on concerning issues of rising Hindu phobia in my show today. आज हमने खुल के बातचीत की है हिंदू फोबिया हिंदू द्वेशा के सिलसिला में जो यहाँ पर इन्वायरमेंट बढ़ती चली जा रही है उसका क्या कंसर्न है नेरेटिव क्या होना चाहिए और उस नेरेटिव को बिल्ड करने के लिए पूरी हिंदू कम्युनिटी को अमेरिका की हो कनाडा की हो उनको क्या काम करने चाहिए अभी मैंने पीछे इंट्रो में अमेरिकन हिंदू ऑर्गेनाइजेशन का जिक्र किया कैनेडा में हिंदू फोरम कैनेडा भी सिलसिला में अब फ्रंट लाइन पे आ चुके हैं वो भी भरपूर काम कर रहे हैं मेरा ख्याल है अब ज़रूरत इस बात की है कि अमेरिकन कैनेडियन और यूरोपियन और ऑस्ट्रेलियन जो हिंदू ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैं उन सब को मिल पूरी दुनिया से इन सब ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को मिल जो राइजिंग हिंदू फोबिया उस पर भरपूर तरीके से अपने हकूक के लिए आवाज़ उठाना चाहिए अपनी स्पेस को क्लेम और रिक्लेम करना चाहिए टैक टी पर मेरे साथ आप इस बहुत ही बर्निंग इशू पर आने वाले दिनों में बहुत सारे शोज़ देखेंगे आज का शो देखने और सुनने का बहुत शुक्रिया आप हमारे यूट्यूब के चैनल को सब्सक्राइब कीजिए इसके साथ साथ आप हमें पे के ज़रिए या पेट्रियन के ज़रिए या हमें आप हमारी वेबसाइट पे या यूट्यूब के चैनल पे जा कर डोनेट के बटन को क्लिक कीजिए ताकि हमारा जो नरेटिव का परिवार है ये इसी तरह स्ट्रॉन्ग तरीके से आगे चल सके आने वाले दिनों में हम पूरे का पूरा प्लान आपके साथ शेयर करेंगे कि किस तरह हम आपस में मिलकर इस हिंदू फोबिया के कैंसर का खात्मा कर सकते हैं एक बार फिर आप सबका बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत शुक्रिया Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.